What are the problems with the ketogenic diet, you say? Well, it's been shown pretty clearly that as you limit your carbohydrates, your cortisol goes up. Cortisol is a powerful stress hormone that has nothing good to do in the human body most of the time. If you're running from a tiger, yeah, cortisol is probably a good thing. If a crocodile is chasing me around the water while I'm surfing, cortisol is maybe good. But most of the time, you don't want your cortisol to be high. When you restrict your carbohydrates, in the study I'll show you, they restricted them to 4% of the macronutrient ratios. 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1, it's a mouthful, that's the enzyme that makes cortisol went up and cortisol levels in the blood throughout the body in these individuals were known to be higher. So yes, eating a ketogenic diet raises your cortisol long-term and why wouldn't it? It's perceived evolutionarily in our bodies as a stressful state. So I would urge you to consider <laughs> that you are upregulating one of the most powerful stress hormones that has aging effects in human physiology when you are eating ketogenic diet. Also, as I mentioned earlier, methylglyoxal, an important advanced glycation end product, which doesn't look good for humans at all, is upregulated by the ketogenic diet. So I'll show you both of those studies and then I'll move on and we'll really um, dig into carbohydrates a bit more. This is the study that I would suggest you check out if you're interested in cortisol and ketogenic diets. Dietary macronutrient content alters cortisol metabolism independently of body weight changes in obese men. As you can see here, they looked at 17 obese men, four weeks of ad libitum, meaning they could eat as much as they wanted, high fat, low carbohydrate, which is 66% fat, 4% carbohydrate, that's pretty ketogenic, or a moderate fat, moderate carbohydrate, which is 35% fat, 35% carbohydrate diet. Conclusions, a low carbohydrate diet, which is 4% carbohydrates in the study, alters cortisol metabolism independently of weight loss. In obese men, this enhances cortisol regeneration by 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type one and reduces cortisol inactivation by A-ring reductases in the liver without affecting subcutaneous adipose 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1. Alterations in cortisol metabolism may be a consequence of macronutrient dietary content and may mediate effects of diet on metabolic health. As you can see in this study, both groups lost weight at the end of the trial, and in fact, the BMI and the fat mass of high-fat, low-carb was not statistically different than medium-fat, medium-carb. So thinking about what you're eating can help you lose weight. You don't have to be ketogenic to do that. As I've said in the past, I think the benefits of a ketogenic diet are in that it controls appetite. But if you think about the quality of your foods and you remove foods, specifically artificial sweeteners, like I talked about in the last podcast, which will hijack your appetite and your insulin signaling, something that many people on ketogenic diets are still eating, high fructose corn syrup, as we'll talk about in this podcast, and seed oils, which will contribute to underlying insulin resistance, your satiety will be better. And you can still lose weight and eat carbohydrates. I'll repeat that statement because it is so important. You can still lose weight. In fact, you can lose an equivalent amount of weight just improving your food quality and eating carbohydrates as you would on a ketogenic diet. And then you have all of the benefits of doing that, which are actually not getting the negatives of a ketogenic diet, hormonal interruptions, electrolyte issues, sleep issues, all these things that come along with that. So first problem with a ketogenic diet, increasing cortisol clearly shown in the medical research. Second problem, methylglyoxal. We'll talk about that right now. As I mentioned, methylglyoxal is a advanced glycation end product, which looks pretty bad for humans. This is an interesting paper. Ketosis leads to increased methylglyoxal production on the Atkins diet. You can see here very clearly stated in this paper that Atkins subjects with ketosis had even greater increases in methylglyoxal, 2.12 fold, as well as acetol and acetone, which increased 4.19 and 7.9 fold respectively. So this is a study to show that methylglyoxal has been measured in patients doing an Atkins diet, both a low carb version and a ketogenic version, and methylglyoxal, a harmful advanced glycation end product in humans, was significantly raised in both of those situations. Now, this is something that I was never warned about when I was doing a ketogenic diet. No one was really speaking about this when I was talking about this. And so I wanted to bring it to people's attentions that I fear that in many ways, methylglyoxal, cortisol, that a ketogenic diet will age you faster <laughs> than if you are eating carbohydrates. And that is not a good thing. We all only get a certain number of heartbeats, a certain number of breaths in our lives. I don't really want that wick to burn faster when I'm trying to do something that is health promoting. 
As I mentioned earlier, there are many ways to lose weight outside of a ketogenic diet. And just because you're losing weight doesn't mean something is healthy. Just because a ketogenic diet leads to weight loss doesn't mean that it's healthy for you in the long term. Is it possible that, that ketogenic diet is in so many ways burning the wick of your life faster? If a ketogenic diet is aging you faster, that's dangerous and something for you to think about. Consider this paper, oxidative stress and aging is methylglyoxal, the hidden enemy. It's a highly reactive dicarbonyl metabolite formed during glucose protein and fatty acid metabolism, especially during fatty acid metabolism. As we know, during ketosis, levels are 2.12 times higher on an Atkins diet with ketosis than they are doing glucose metabolism. They're elevated in hyperglycemia and other conditions. An excess of methylglyoxal formation can increase reactive oxygen production and cause oxidative stress. Methylglyoxal reacts with proteins, DNA, and other biomolecules and is a major precursor of advanced glycation end products. I'll let you guys read through this article in detail if you'd like, but is this something that is accelerating aging? Uh, I fear that it may be. So I know that many of you who are interested in these diets are doing so for the right reasons. And the people who are discussing these diets in a positive light on the social media are doing it for the right reasons. They want to help you. But I think it's important that we understand the whole perspective when we are making a decision about how to structure our diets for optimal health, optimal aging, optimal longevity. Refer to the longevity podcast I did last year if you're curious about how an animal-based diet, which is what I do advocate for, which is like a carnivore diet, but includes uh, organs and meat, also fruit, honey, raw dairy, other sources of carbohydrates. So this is my evolution, as many of you who are familiar with my work will know. So those are the two major problems I see with ketosis. And there are many minor problems, electrolyte imbalances, hormones, sex hormone binding globulin, sleep disturbances, all things that I talked about earlier. But the major ones are cortisol connected with 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type one and methylglyoxal. So again, that is the framework of this conversation.